FEC lab? With this vast pool of quality human resource, was bed at the right time to provide critical thinking and ideation around policy options and services, including rethinking our approach to governance and how to better the socioeconomic conditions of our Ghanaian people. I've been engaging and following the work of the NDC lab since 2021 when it was formed. I've personally participated in some of your deliberations and have experienced at first hand your professionalism, meticulousness, attention to detail, and above all, your love of nation. Comrades, as this dialogue marks another phase of the NDC's policy development uh, process, it is also the clearest indication of how far we have come as a party and our readiness for the elections of December 2024. There have always been ever ready and well thought through and progressive policy proposals coming out of the NDC lab engagements, and thus for the benefit of the party and also for our presidential campaign at the end of this year. However, and as is one of the objectives of this dialogue, a few of these policy proposals require some fine tuning, and it is one of the reasons I'm particularly happy that this policy dialogue session has taken place. I'm sure you'd all have found it useful in all the presentations that were made and I believe that we're going to have solid proposals, not only for our manifesto pre-December 2024, but for policy implementation when our government comes to power in 2025. <laughs> As NDC lab members form majority of the membership of the manifesto and sector committees, it provides for a seamless continuation and flow of work leading to the timely finalization of the 2024 manifesto and its eventual launch. Comrades, there is no need to re-echo the fact that Ghana is currently gripped with its worst socioeconomic crisis in uh, several decades. The Ghana Statistical Service only recently, on Wednesday this week, reported that unemployment keeps rising and currently stands at a staggering 14.7%. As nearly 1.4 million young people aged between 15 to 25 are unemployed, and this is in the first three quarters of 2023 alone. This, by every account, is a very harrowing situation. Worsening living conditions, unbearable hardships, a spiraling cost of living, high inflation, rising inequality, a widening gap between the haves and the have-nots, a steep erosion of the purchasing power of households, an unsustainable public debt, massive debt defaults, a failing currency, and astronomic budget deficits tell the tale of a catastrophic economic meltdown, which is the result of shocking mismanagement and the ineptitude of the Akufado Baumia administration. Compounding our miserable circumstances as Ghanaians are astonishing levels of governmental corruption and plain thievery of our resources, severely weakened and heavily politicized governance institutions serving the NPP rather than the national interest, and more particularly the inseparable arrogance of power displayed by this administration. This is not the Ghana we subscribe to. Without a doubt, this current iteration of our country requires urgent rebuilding, anchored on our collective aspirations with workable, progressive, and sustainable policies. Comrades, I've had the opportunity to go through the consolidated reports from the thematic working groups, and thus the Finance, Economy, Human, Development, and Governance Working Group reports I have had the opportunity to look at. I can observe that, apart from the fact that the policy proposals clearly seek to address the current Akufuado Baumia created twin challenges of economic and governance crisis, the proposals also directly respond to most of the thorny issues raised by Ghanaians during my ongoing Building Ghana tours. I am hopeful that the deliberations you have had these two days have helped tighten the loose ends, particularly in respect of the implementational framework for these policies. 
We're acutely aware that we do not have the benefit of time at all from 7th January, it's just around the corner. After we get sworn into office, Ghanaians have high hopes. <laughs> Ghanaians have high hopes and expectations which we have every intention of meeting. These high expectations in the next NDC administration reflect their unwavering belief in our ability to deliver. And that is why I'm again happy that the NDC lab has already stepped into the next phase of considering the implementation and action points in respect of our key and flagship policy proposals. As I said, the work of the lab is not only geared towards the manifesto, but policy implementation when we have come into office post 7th January 2025. The enormity of the challenges we face today and those that we will uncover would mean that we must come into government with a clear plan and a strategy. We have the plan and strategy and we know exactly what to do from the very moment we are sworn into office on 7th January 2025. Since 2021, I have outlined over 60 different policy proposals carefully curated to restore our economy and national life in general into a much better state. In particular, the 24-hour economic policy pledge has found resonance with most Ghanaians, especially the youth, as confirmed by both data-based and anecdotal evidence. And I wish to thank our comrade Nimoy for a very good presentation on the 24-hour economy policy and strategy. This policy has offered hope to an increasingly restless and despondent population that the half measures and mismanagement they are under in the Akufuado Abamia administration, which has plunged us into suffering, will soon give way to more prudent and forward looking programs. The 24 hour economy now remains perhaps the surest way to achieve significant economic expansion, to boost productivity, meet demand, curb unbridled imports and its attendant negative effect on our economy. And currently, and above all, generate well-paying jobs for the millions of our people who are currently without employment. I'm encouraged by the very positive feedback and input we continue to receive on the proposal from our compatriots in organized labor, academia, business, and industry. This fits in perfectly with the consultative approach that is informing our policy formulation, and I can reveal the completion of a policy strategy document on the proposals which we will soon share with the people of Ghana. We remain determined to build the Ghana we want together with all Ghanaians so that we can collectively reap the outcomes of our shared prosperity. The policy dialogue is further proof of our desire to subject our policy proposals to scrutiny and to synthesize various views to enable us refine and fine tune them to meet the expectations of our dear people. The widespread acceptance of the 24 hour policy appears to have sent the NPP campaign into a tailspin leading to a frenzied effort to attack it through calumny and disinformation in these last few days. We are fortified in the knowledge that the days when the NPP assumed that they could use falsehood to hoodwink Ghanaians for electoral advantage are over. Especially because of their horrific performance in the last seven years after they were entrusted with the administration of our dear nation Ghana. There's no room in leadership for excuse making and flight from responsibility. You cannot make grandiose promises on the economy pre-2016 only to be put in charge of the same in government, run it down and push all of us into suffering and hardship and turn around to say, you are only the mate of a reckless driver. <laughs> and therefore you should be excused from culpability. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, not only do I have a much better and measurable record of performance in both my role as vice president and as head of the economic management team, and later as president, than my main contender in this year's elections. Not only do I have a much better and measurable record of performance in both my role as vice president and head of the economic management team, and later as president, than my main contender in this year's elections, 
But I also have a record of taking responsibility. Same cannot be said of my opponent. I note that my long espoused pledges to substantially reduce the size of government by having much fewer ministers, appointees, and to abolish the payment of ex gratia to scrap some taxes like the e-levy and carry out far-reaching constitutional and government finance reforms have compelled my opponents to promise same despite being front of center of the poor governance under which all these ills have taken place. I mean business on the promises I have made and I intend to keep them. I'm therefore pleased with the work done so far on the implementation metrics in respect of the realignment of our ministerial architecture for a resilient and efficient governance structure to deliver more responses and caring government after the public good. The resilience government structure will be anchored on ICT uptake and innovations, and the same innovation will drive some of our other job creation efforts. It is in the light of this that the next NDC government seeks to partner with local tech startups and businesses to launch a digital jobs initiative to create at least 300,000 skilled employment opportunities for young people. We shall also establish a fintech growth fund with an initial seed capital of USD $50 million to support indigenous companies. to support indigenous companies in fostering the growth of the digital economy. Our brothers and sisters and children who are interested in coding will have the opportunity to participate in our Coding for Employment program, which is targeted to train one million coders with in-demand digital skills for the growing business process outsourcing and knowledge process outsourcing ecosystems. Comrades, it's again instructive to note that work has already begun with the collection of data of all abandoned and uncompleted public infrastructure projects. This is to enable us to undertake an inventory and assessment of all uncompleted and abandoned government projects across all sectors of the country, in particular health, care, and educational facilities and make annual budgetary allocations towards their upgrade and completion in order of priority. The system for the collection of the data gives us a quick snapshot into all these abandoned and uncompleted projects at a go, including their present fiscal location and their, the states and condition in which they are. Ladies and gentlemen, the novelty here is that we're doing this now as a government in waiting that is in opposition. We do not want to be sworn into office on 7 January 2025 before we commence the preliminary phase of work on uh, making an inventory of these abandoned projects. <laughs> so even out of government, we are expending resources to make this inventory so that we can hit the ground running. We are ready and a lot is happening. I have the utmost confidence that very soon we shall see and have a feel of a manifesto that responds to the day-to-day -day needs of Ghanaians and leverages on our shared aspirations and common identity when it is launched. A manifesto that will be anchored on the people's will. We are ready. I am ready. We are ready, and I am ready, to lead us to build the Ghana we want together. The beautiful thing is I have equally seen the readiness and eagerness of the Ghanaian people to join us on this journey of rebuilding ourselves and our society. And to the majority of Ghanaians and voters on our side, be rest assured we shall protect your votes. And even those who are not on our side, rest assured, we shall protect your votes. Yeah. 
We shall let the true voice of the people speak. And we shall make sure that the outcome of this election is a true reflection of the wishes of the people of Ghana. This is my pledge to you, and we shall work together to build the Ghana we want. On this note, I formally declare this policy dialogue session closed. I thank you for your kind attention, and may God bless our homeland Ghana. Thank you very much.